Shem Hashem Naaseh and Atzliach, Shul Torah, Baruch Hashem. We are back in Hollywood. Another Shul, another week. Lots going on in the world, Baruch Hashem. Um, last week, we're actually at number 24 in the series. Baruch Hashem, we'll be going on for uh, some time. Uh, was it uh, six months already? We're doing uh, Shul in the Baruch Hashem. Seems like we started a month ago. So it's good. Um, six months, seven months. Um, last week I told you guys I have a small introduction, then I took the whole shiur, and you guys didn't ask any questions. So uh, today we'll start off with your questions, and then once you run out of questions, I'll ask some questions. So go ahead, who wants to go first? Chavon, by the way. So the difference is the Davot um, whether it's Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, all the giants, all the people that are mentioned in the Torah, by default, they didn't think like us. They didn't think in a perverted mind like us. Um, and quite frankly, even until 900 years ago, people didn't think like us. Because even Rashi says, Rav Shalom, that uh, it was standard even for the non-Jewish women to be virgins in his time, before they got married. Standard. Like, wasn't something that they would worry about, he said. Um, but yet, Rabbeinu Gershon, almost a thousand years ago, already comes out with a, uh, a change in Allah a thousand years ago, Forbidding, forbidding the uh, Torah's permission to marry more than one wife. According to the Torah, a Jew is allowed to marry more than one wife. A king is allowed to marry 18 wives. And uh, Shlomo Melech actually took it to a different level for different reasons, which I'll explain in a moment. But uh, the point is that Rabbeinu Gershon himself saw that in his generation it can from his generation on it can no longer be done anymore and the reason why is because the state of mind of an average person changed so drastically that he knew that people were getting married for the wrong reason instead of getting married for the for the sanctity of marriage for the holiness of marriage for the holiness of fulfilling mitzvot through the marriage uh, we were getting married, unfortunately, for lustrous reasons. And one of the ways that he actually uh, saw it is uh, through his own experience with two women, with two wives, where the, the wives got jealous of each other to such an extent that one of them got him arrested. One of them got arrested, got him arrested, and he went into a uh, high prison. They built a tower, and they put him in a prison. Put him in a prison. And he couldn't leave. And he, through using Kabbalah Ma'asit, all types of mystical aspects of Torah, he got freed from the, uh, from the uh, jail, from the tower that had no, no, no uh, door to get in, no door to get out. The Yomah sealed him in to die. But to Kabbalah Ma'asit, he used the webs of spider and so on. It's a very uh, interesting story when you go into the details of it. But nonetheless, he saw after that, we cannot be married to two wives anymore because we're not doing it for the same reasons that Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov did it, that David and Shlomo did it, and so on. Now, David, I heard once, when uh, it came time to uh, uh, that story that you're saying, which is uh, he was getting old and uh, sick and, and he was dying, and they wanted to warm him up, and they brought him a virgin. And they thought that maybe because of the uh, hotness of, of, of being attracted to, a, to a, uh, a new woman, maybe this is going to be uh, enough to keep him alive, if you will. And David simply was telling her and everyone else that it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. For him, he was mourning the fact that he wasn't able to build a bit of Mikdash. And his time has come. And he knew that he wasn't going to be able to achieve building the Bet HaMikdash. 
Hashem told him that he's not going to build a Beit Mikdash, that his son is going to build a Beit Mikdash, and the answer and the question is why? David Melech is Kodesh Kodeshim. The Mashiach comes from David Melech. Why not let him build a Beit Mikdash? And Hashem says because you have blood on your hands. But then you have another sugya. You have another question here. What's the question? Wait a minute. What did I fight for? For myself? I fought for you, Hashem. He didn't fight for himself. He didn't fight because he just wanted to beat up the next guy. He fought Milchemet uh, Kodesh, the, the war of, of holiness, holy wars. Why fight? Still, nonetheless, Hashem says, this is not your job in the world. You build the foundation, your son is going to build the, the rest. So David, dealing with this, was very difficult for him. Because it had nothing to do with Gava. It had nothing to do with ego. Ooh, I'm the one that's going to build Bet Migdash. Ooh, I'm Mashiach. No, it had nothing to do with that. It's, in essence, very similar to the difficulty that Moshe Rabbeinu went through at the end of his life. If you see at the Parashat Vayet Hanan, the first word of Parashat Vayet Hanan is Vayet Hanan. What's Vayet Hanan? Moshe begged. Begged. He begged Hashem, and the numerical value of Vayet Hanan is 515. From there we learn, Gimatri of Vayet Hanan is 515. From there we learn, Moshe begged Hashem 515 times to let him into Eretz Yisrael. To let him into Eretz Yisrael. And Hashem said, Rav Lach, enough, no more. Don't pray anymore. Why didn't he just say no? Why didn't he just say, no, Moshe, no. Prayed once, no. No, I don't want to, I don't want to let you in. Why didn't he say no? Because a person still has pchira. A person still has free choice. He has free choice to pray. He has free choice to make mitzvot. He has free choice to do Hashem's will. He has free choice to go against Hashem's will. And Moshe Rabbeinu was not looking to go into Eretz Yisrael because of his ego to say, hey, look, I took Am Yisrael from the Tum'ah of Egypt all the way to the Promised Land, all the way to Eretz Yisrael. Look what I did. No, I had nothing to do with that. Moshe Rabbeinu was begging Hashem, just let me in so I can fulfill another mitzvah. Now, if you don't want to let me in as a leader... You don't want to let me in as Moshe Rabbeinu. Let me in as a servant. I'll let Yeshua Rabbeinu. You, you picked Yeshua Rabbeinu to be the leader. I'll be his servant. I'm not Moshe Rabbeinu anymore. I'm a pretend. I'm somebody else. I'm his servant now. Let, let me in just so I can fulfill a mitzvah in Eretz Yisrael that I can't fulfill outside of Eretz Yisrael. There's certain mitzvot. There's a handful of mitzvot you cannot fulfill outside of Eretz Yisrael. Or a little more. You cannot fulfill outside of Eretz Yisrael. And Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to fulfill them. Hashem says, no, you cannot go into Eretz Yisrael. He says, okay, so maybe he's not a servant, maybe not as a human. Let me in as a cow. Put me in a Gilgul, let me go in a reincarnation, let me go as a cow. Let me go as a cow. Hashem says, no. Okay, maybe not a cow. Cow's too big, takes a lot of space. Maybe not a cow, I mean a dove. A dove, a little dove, cute little dove. Nobody's going to notice me. Fly, 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 fly away. I'll fly in, I'll fly out, finished. No. The question the Chachamim asks is why? Why? First of all, why did he have to go through 515 begging? 515 prayers. Because we learned in last week's parasha, Barotecha, that all of Am Yisrael, millions and millions of people, we're talking about millions of people, cried, begging, screamed to Hashem Itbarach, Please, Hashem, heal Miriam. Please heal her. Nothing. Nothing happens. Aaron, at the end of the parasha, comes to Moshe, and he says to Moshe, Miriam was afflicted with Sarat. Please, I beg you, my Lord, do not cast sin upon us, for we have been foolish to have sinned. You know, we spoke Lashon Ara. Let her not be like a corpse. Like one who leaves his mother's womb with half his flesh having been consumed. Meaning she's your sister. Pray for her. Look at how she looks. Miskina, she has tzarat. You know what tzarat looks like? Shemir achem. Your whole skin turns white. It's a nightmare. Spiritual and physical disease. Please, she's your sister. What does Moshe do? Vaitzak Moshe ladonai lemo elna refanala. 
Moshe, cries out to Hashem, screams to Hashem, screams to Hashem, please God, heal her. Now, five words. What happens? She got healed. Millions of people are screaming to Hashem. Millions. Nothing. Moshe, five words, finished. Healed. Healed. So imagine 515 times this at least. Five hundred. So obviously Hashem must have had a good reason. Because five words you healed, a prayer that millions of people couldn't do, 515 times minimum times this, it's a big deal. So why does Hashem say, Parashat Vayit Hanan to Moshe Rabbeinu, Rav Lach, enough, don't pray anymore. Because Hashem it Barach know that he told Moshe Rabbeinu when they first met, when they first met, they first did the deal, Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me that I spoke to you? Hashem says, you're right. You're right. Maybe they're not going to believe you. So you give him signs. Give him signs that uh, these few words, pakod yifkod, plus your mate, your stick, your, sh- your shaft, plus show him that your hand turns to tzarat. You give him a few signs that they're going to know for sure that you spoke to me. And most importantly, I'm going to speak to you in front of everyone. I'm going to speak to you in front of everyone so they believe in me and in you forever. Not just Hashem says to him specifically. They're going to believe in me, Hashem, and you forever. What does it mean they're going to believe in me and you forever? He says, just like anything, the fact that you're becoming Moshe Rabbeinu, you're becoming the Mashiach, the Goel, you're the first one that cared in history. Of Am Yisrael being in Egypt, 210 years, the Chachamim asked, how come it took 210 years for, for Hashem Yitbach to send Moshe Rabbeinu? Why didn't he send them uh, after a few years, two years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years? Why did they take 210 years? The Chachamim says, because no one cared enough to sacrifice his own life to save Am Yisrael until Moshe Rabbeinu. No one cared enough. Everybody wanted to say, listen, I'll get my own house, I have my own car. If I tell people not to violate Shabbat, they're not going to come to my Beknesset. It's not comfortable. It's politically incorrect. I really want to invite the Christian professor to come speak in my shul next week. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of a, of a Harry Potter book. Let me finish that. Uh, my, my wife just got a new wig. I don't want to tell people that it's Abu Dazara. It doesn't look so good for the family. My, girl, my, my daughter is on a shiduch. You know, it's not... Everybody was worried for themselves. Moshe Rabbein who said, I'll sacrifice my life. Hashem says, because you will to sacrifice your life for my people, and you don't have any promise. I didn't promise you anything. I didn't promise you, listen, if you do this, I'm going to give you anything. Because you're doing it for nothing, I'm going to give you something. What am I going to give you? I'm going to give you eternity. Eternity I'm going to give you. What's eternity? They're going to believe in me and you forever. Me and you forever. So now that means that everything that Moshe Rabbeinu touched had to be eternal. Moshe Rabbeinu touched the Ten Commandments, eternal. The Torah, eternal. Am Yisrael, eternal. But now he says, I want to go to Eretz Yisrael. Impossible. Why? Because if you go to Eretz Yisrael, what are you going to do first? You're going to fulfill the mitzvah. What mitzvah are you going to fulfill? You're going to build the Bet, bet- the Mikdash. You're going to build the Bet the Mikdash. You build the Bet the Mikdash, it's eternal. That's a problem. Why is it a problem? Because Hashem knows that Am Yisrael is going to sin. And the Malach HaMavet, the Satan, the Yetzirah, all of them the same thing Gemara Masar Ebrachot says. So they come to Hashem 1,400 years later. It says, look Hashem, 1,000 years later, Hashem, look, your people sinned. They did Abu Dazara, they murdered, they uh, had uh, sex crimes, all these different things. Hashem, Hashem, you have to kill them. Hashem says, yeah, you're right, but you know what? There's only one thing in the world that has the same weight. What is it? My own house. So I'll destroy my own house instead of my people. But now if Moshe, my son, builds the, builds the house, I promise them it's eternal. I can't change my promises. I'm not some, uh, you know, some human being that changes his mind. I'm not a human being that changes my mind. I'm not open orthodox that has a new rule every day. I'm not reformed that has a new halakha every week. I'm Hashem. So if I promise Moshe Rabbeinu he's eternal like me, meaning they're going to believe in him forever, 
that means that the Bet Migdash that he built is forever. I can't destroy it. If I can't destroy the Bet Migdash, that means I have to destroy my people. Destroy my people, I have to destroy the whole world. So Moshe Rabbeinu, please, Rav Lach, enough, don't pray anymore. Why don't pray anymore? Because he says you have the free choice to pray more. But if you pray 516 times, instead of 515, one more prayer, I have to give you, according to the rules of creation, I have to allow you to go into Eretz Yisrael, which means Am Yisrael is going to be destroyed. Rav Lach. So we see that the Moshe Rabbeinu, who had, technically, if he was selfish, if he was selfish, he would say, listen, let me, I, I worked so hard, let me get in. Let me get in, and then I'll do a shiur, give them some musal, tell them don't do this in 1,400 years. And that's it, finished. Let me just go in. I, mean, I worked so hard, 80 years, I'm on my head. These people are bothering me for 40 years in the desert. They're driving me crazy. They're calling me a womanizer, a thief. Every name under the sun they're calling me. Let me at least get paid. Let me go to Eretz Yisrael. Let me go to uh, vacation a little bit. But Moshe Rabbeinu says, the whole thing is for Hashem. If Hashem says no, he doesn't want me to do it, then I don't want to do it. Not that I don't want to go to Eretz Yisrael. I don't want to do it because Hashem said no. So his whole purpose was to fulfill the will of Hashem. He had no personal desires. David HaMelech, in essence, wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to build a Beit HaMikdash, not because he wanted to have his name on it like a Trump building, Le'avdil, because he wanted to fulfill the, the will of Hashem. So when he found out that he cannot fulfill a mitzvah and honor and sanctify Hashem's name, for him, this was like death penalty. This was like death penalty. So when she came to him and they gave him, they thought maybe it's something else. They thought maybe he's sick, physically sick. They thought maybe he is, uh, you know, is something. They didn't realize this is a sickness that has no cure. So they sent him, they thought maybe I'm going to, you know, give him, you know, some heat from a virgin. Maybe he's going to get turned on. He says, I have nothing to do with it. But now when she says, oh, maybe you can't perform, maybe, you know, maybe you can't perform, she says, ah, this can turn to Chilul Hashem. Why can't turn to Chilul Hashem? Because maybe she's going to go and tell people, oh, yeah, the, the king is old and, and, and Hashem took away everything from him. He can't even be a man anymore. Now the kavod of the king, the Torah says the kavod of the king does not belong to him. Hashem picks the king. The kavod, the honor of the king, does not belong to him. Meaning if somebody dishonors the king, the king has no permission to forgive him. Somebody dishonors the king, he has to kill them. There's no permission to let him go. Why? Because it's not your kavod. It's Hashem's kavod. Hashem put you in position. So now he knows that if he doesn't do something to show her without a doubt that he is mamash, the koach that he has is beyond human. The position that he has is beyond human. Then you see, then she is going to understand and there's no fear of Hashem's name being desecrated. From this Maaseh, there's more to say, but I think this covers it to some extent. But from this Maaseh, we learn something, some Musal. The Torah is not a history book. The Torah is a book that tells us certain details that unless we delve really deep into them, and cover them from every single corner 500 more times than what we just did now. 500 more times. We didn't even cover 1% of 1%. You're not going to understand it. There's always going to be a suffix. There's always going to be a little bit of a doubt. So the Gemara says there was one of the Tanaim had a, uh, was very poor. Kodesh Kodeshim, but had no money to eat. And... Uh, one day he told his Talmudim, listen, we need to get a donkey, so please go get me a donkey. So they went to this Arab, they went to this Arab, and they bought a donkey. They bought a donkey, they bring the donkey. On the way home, on the way to, to, to the rabbi, they see that the donkey has something in his hair. They look through the hair, you see it's a huge diamond. They're so happy for the rabbi, they're so excited to give it to their rabbi. He's finally going to have food to eat. He's going to be rich. He's going to go from poor to rich. This is a blessing from Hashem. 
They get to the rabbi, Kvod Arab, we have amazing news. Look, we got the donkey. Baruch Hashem, we got the donkey. We got something better. We got something better. What do we got? We got a diamond. $100 million. Here. Kvod Arab, for you. This is Talmidim. Talmidim that he has is going to give him the diamond. My Talmidim borrow money from me. <laughs> we need to switch. But the point is, he has $100 million diamond. $100 million diamond. He says, I'm sorry. You have to go return the diamond. I bought, I bought the donkey, not the diamond. Now because he wasn't sure if they are going to do the right thing or not, he went himself. He went himself to the Arab. He told him, here, sir, I bought the donkey. The donkey I paid for. The diamond I didn't pay for. This is your diamond. What does the Arab say? The Arab says, blessed is your God. Why did he say, Chazaku Baruch, you're amazing. I'll give you half. Here's some prize money. What did he say, blessed is your God? What does that have to do with him? What does that have to do with him? Well, it's you, no? He did it. He returned the diamond. He could have kept it. According to Allah, according to Allah, he's allowed to keep it. If a guy makes a mistake, you don't, you don't have to give it back. If a Jew makes a mistake, you have to give it back. If a guy makes a mistake, you don't have to give it back. But if you give it back and you tell him, I only gave it back because my God commanded me to, be an honorable, ethical person, and turns into Kiddush Hashem, you just made the best mitzvah in the entire Torah. But technically, you don't have to. It's not an avera. You don't go to Gainom for not doing it. You don't go to Gainom. There's a lot of other reasons to go to Gainom. This one's not. So now, he says, he does this big thing, this big Kiddush Hashem. The Arab, instead of saying, Chazak Uba'oh, give him some prize money, what does he do? He says, blessed is your God. Lama blessed is your God. Why? I heard Arabi again, Allah Shalom, say once, he says, the Arab understood, the Arab understood something that we're not understanding about the whole Maaseh with David. The Arab understood something that we don't understand from the whole Maaseh with Moshe. What did he understand, the Arab? What did he understand? He understood that it's not within the power of a human being to return a hundred million dollar diamond when he doesn't have food to eat. It's not human power. It's not possible for a human being to do it. It's only his God do it. Only the power of his God is able to do it. Meaning, the only reason you return it is because of God. God gave you this power. You want to fulfill his will, he gave you a chance to fulfill it to the best possibility. Moshe Rabbeinu, Wanted to fulfill his will, Hashem gave him the ability to fulfill it at the highest possibility. How? Remove your own free choice. You can pray one more time. You can pray one more time and go to Eretz Yisrael. One more time. I'm telling you, you pray one more. Rav Lach, what's Rav Lach says? Enough. Meaning, I'm telling you, one more prayer, I'm going to change nature. And let you get in. I'm giving you an opportunity to sanctify my name even higher. To get yourself even higher. Same thing with David Melech. Same thing with David Melech. These giants were given an opportunity to do something bigger than them themselves. But it's difficult. It's painful. It's Mesirut Nefesh. And from there we learn that Mesirut Nefesh, without Mesirut Nefesh, without self-sacrifice, you're never going to be anything in life. You're never going to be anything in life. All the prayers you can pray to the Knesset, at home, in the Kolel, the Gemara you learn, the Gemara you don't learn, the, the, all that, it's good. Chazak Baruch. But you're never going to get to be anything without Mesirut Nefesh. If you started to sacrifice, Hashem will give you an opportunity to sacrifice even more. He'll so give you sacrifice even more. It's difficult. It's painful. The... Uh, answer for Shlomo Melech, for example, of how he uh, tried outsmarting the Alakha by marrying a thousand women. It says at the end of his life that his actions were not liked, were not favored by Hashem. Were not favored by Hashem. And the Gemara says. It was better off for Shlomo HaMelech to be a drunk his whole life, never be a king for 70 years, 
and this verse not be written about him. Why? Shlomo Melech, Kodesh Kodeshim. We have three books by him. Three books by Shlomo Melech. We have Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes, and we have Song of Songs. Three books by Shlomo Melech. The Chachamim say all the books are Kodesh. Song of Songs, Kodesh Kodeshim. Who wrote it? Shlomo Melech. Shlomo Melech wrote, wrote Song of Songs. Initially, they wanted to remove it. Why? Because they didn't understand the song. They thought it's between a man and a woman. They didn't understand the man is Hashem, the woman is, is, is Am Yisrael. They didn't understand the meaning behind it, the deep meaning behind it. But the point is that Shlomo Melech, with all of his gdula, it says here that if he never has this verse on him, it was better off than his whole life, than all the books he wrote, everything he ever did. Why? Because Shlomo Melech, from that action, from that verse, he almost lost his Olam Abba. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says that there are four kings, four kings that have no share of the world to come. Now originally when the Sanhedrin came together, they didn't have just Yehovam and Achav. They also wanted to put Shlomo Melech in there too. They wanted to put Shlomo Melech in the list. That he has no share of the world to come. Say, so why he has no share of the world to come? Look, it says in the Torah, Hashem didn't like his actions. They didn't like his actions. So they were going to write, they were going to put a psak din that Shlomo Melech has no share of the world to come. David Melech, his father, came from Olam Abba. David Melech came from Olam Abba, came to the Sanhedrin, started crying to them, please, he's my son, he's Sadiq. He, he went to the best yeshiva, Kola is Chacham. He only did the will of Hashem. He loved him. He is. The only reason why he married a thousand women was because he wanted to bring the Mashiach. He didn't do it because he's uh, some crazy, lustrous desires. You're not understanding him. He tried to bring the Mashiach. The Mashiach has to bring world peace. So if uh, he's married to all the to all the countries, there's world peace. It's one of the nevoot. It's one of the it's one of the prophecies fulfilling a prophecy by world peace. This is also how we know the Rebbe or, or, or is not the Mashiach because there's no world peace. It's also how we know that uh, uh, J C Penny Lavdil is not the Mashiach because there's no world peace. In essence, actually, uh, the uh, J C Penny only created more war and killed millions and millions of Jews. In his name, there's been millions, of, hundreds of millions of people killed in the name of J C Penny. So, we know it's not the Mashiach. These are simple. Shlomo Melech, Kodesh Kodeshim, he said, if I marry all the countries, all the cities, all the towns, all the everything, there's world peace. So, David Melech is begging, he's begging the Sanhedrin. Imagine, David Melech comes to you right now, comes to the Shio, hey, you know, what are you guys learning? What are you guys learning? You're not going to listen to him? No, no, we're going to learn from you. We're waiting for you this whole time. What? <laughs> So Nedlin says, we're sorry, David, we don't listen, you're, you're not in this world, we don't, this is not the way we take, uh, we learn Allah like this, we don't learn Allah like this. Go back to where you came from. Uh, they were about to finish the line to put a psak din, that Shlomo HaMelech has no share of the world to come from. Here we learn that whatever the bed din of Mata, of this world, concludes, the Bet Din of Shemaim also concludes. Wrong or right is irrelevant. If they conclude it here, they have real source to conclude it here, in Shemaim they conclude the same thing. Which means that it has an impact. If they conclude here, Shlomo Melech, Shem Echem, has no share of the world to come, and Shemaim does do the same thing. So what happens? Hashem gets involved. A bat call comes from Shemaim and says to the Sanhedrin, what is it to you who gets Olam Abba or not? Is it coming out of your cheshbon? Is it coming out of your account? Is it coming from your pockets? Were you paying for it? What do you care who comes? It, leave him alone. He said, we're sorry. We don't learn from Batkol. We don't learn from Batkol. You understand the level of Kedusha these people have? Is This is Kodesh. Did you hear Batkol today? I didn't. They heard about Batkol. Not only they heard about Batkol, talk to them. 
Then talk to somebody else. Some people tell me, yeah, yeah, Hashem spoke to me. I said, what did he say? I says, uh, do, 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 it's this thing. I said, okay, fine, wow, shh, you're a prophet. You're a prophet. There's one guy, man, every week I have somebody new. Every week I have somebody new that spoke, speaks to Hashem. Apparently Hashem speaks to people on a regular basis. So there's one guy in Los Angeles tells me, yeah, yeah, Hashem speaks to me. And he tells me secrets and all types of things. And uh, I know you said there's no more prophets, but uh, I think he made an exception with me. So, you know, I mean, what are we going to do with crazy people? You know, crazy people, miskinim. What are you going to do with them? You can't insult them because they don't know they're crazy. A crazy guy doesn't know he's crazy. If he knew he's crazy, he wouldn't be crazy. But now at the same time, I t uh, you can't let him continue doing this. So I tell him, listen, I know you believe what you said because there's people around. It's after the lecture. There's people around, maybe 20 people around that stayed after the lecture. And he's saying this stuff that Hashem talks to him and, and, and on a regular basis and so on. I said, I know you believe what you say, but you shouldn't tell people this. Because even if it's true, no one's going to believe you anyway. And it makes you look crazy. Which I'm thinking, I'm hoping that the crazy person will understand he shouldn't look crazy. But he said, no, no, but you don't understand. And he continues and he continues and he continues and he continues. He continues. It's a prophet. Okay. So uh, I said, uh, Ah, we talked about something. I continue to talk about something else. He goes, what does that word mean? I said, which word? And uh, whatever word it was in Hebrew. I said a word in Hebrew. He goes, what does it mean? I explained to him what it means. And I really, wait, you don't speak Hebrew? <laughs> Be the first prophet in history doesn't speak Hebrew. But he's then, it's, he's again, he's crazy. What can you do? But I have a new crazy guy every week. Every week I have a new crazy guy. I have two of them on my, uh, currently, hounding me on my uh, YouTube. One guy says he's David the Melech himself. You see it, you see it, it's on it's on it right now. I haven't I haven't been able to, I've, I've blocked him 50 times and still it keeps coming. I don't know, YouTube takes like 100 times, maybe 515 times. I have to beg YouTube to block these people. So one guy says he's David the Melech. The other guy, who is he? I think he's Jesus. I think he's, then one guy is David, one guy is Jesus, and I think Bil'am is coming also. All, all of the people, you know, it's, you see, if you, it's very entertaining. My, my YouTube videos, you see the comments, very entertaining. I, I, I usually delete most of it because it's stuyot, um, and people lose focus. But the point, let's get back to the point. What is the point? I forgot already. So now, Shlomo HaMelech, his future is on the line. Not future like our future, we're here 70 years. Future eternity. Hashem Itbar sends a bad call. What's it to you, Chachamim? What's it to you? Say, yeah, we don't learn halacha this way. So then Hashem says, listen, if I let them complete it, my son Shlomo is going to be punished forever. So Hashem interfered and he scared all of them out of the Bedin. They all ran away. He scared them all out of the Bedin. They all ran away. Baruch Hashem. Shlomo Melech is on the Lama Ba. But you see here that the, the sages, it wasn't just a bunch of people that knew a few things. Like people think that your local rabbi, if he has a different opinion than the sages, we should listen to the local rabbi. Or if you learned Parashat Shavua and you got a new chidush, then we should listen to you, not Rashi. People think that, they, that, that their opinion is so valuable sometimes. They lose, they lose the understanding of who the sages were. The Ben Ishchai says that anyone that thinks that the sages, of just even the previous generation, not even, we're not even talking about the Gemara, if he thinks that the sages of the previous generation were like him, that were able to make mistakes like him, he's simply a donkey. Don't pay attention to him. He's not really a human, he's just a donkey. Don't pay attention to him. So, we see that Shlomo Melech made a wrong decision with all of the wisdom that he had he made a wrong decision which is that he wanted to take matters into his hands and say listen dalacha of a king marrying 18 wives and limiting the amount of horses that he has and wealth that he has it's for people that don't have my wisdom but because i have the wisdom meaning i have the kedusha i know torah better than anybody else i know chokhmah better than everybody else to such an extent, they say that his, his chokhmah was literally one level below God. 
To such chokhmah, it's not a human being. It's not a regular human being. It's not like, oh, he was really smart like Einstein. No. Einstein doesn't have, his, his IQ is like a monkey next to uh, Shlomo Melech. So he's thinking, with all my chokhmah, I'm not going to go and lose myself through these women or money or anything else. So here we see that sometimes you have to be tamim. You have to be simple with Hashem. Hashem said, no, you do no. Why? It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't really, it honestly, it doesn't make a difference why no. He said, no, no. And that was the mistake, if you will, that Shlomo HaMelech made in comparison to his father, David. When David found out news he didn't want to hear, he mourned about it. He mourned about it to himself, but still fulfilled Hashem's, Hashem's will. Shlomo tried to go around it to see maybe there's another way. David did not. Moshe not only didn't, he accepted it 100%. There's different levels. I'll violate it to be any one of their shoes. But uh, hopefully that answers to some extent your question, but some of it, I think. Some of it, some parts of it. At least that's what I know. If I think of anything else, I'll answer more. Go ahead, next question. 40 minutes later. If every question is going to be 40 minutes, you guys are not going to have any uh, chidushim. Hmm? Um, I'm a from family, which is the bottom and everything. Are they allowed to sit shiva for a child who um, did eat shiva? Their own child? Can they're allowed to sit shiva for them? Uh, I mean, it's a uh, when it comes to things like that, emotions. All bets are off, you know. Technically, when a person, you know, the chachamim say that a person that didn't keep Shabbat, you shouldn't even say kaddish on him because he wasn't considered a Jew, but you're allowed to. You shouldn't, but you're you're allowed to. Why? Because he was a big sinner. He didn't keep Shabbat. He died, left this world, uh, you know. But nonetheless, people still do. You're even allowed to say Kaddish, not only on a Mechel Shabbat, you're allowed to say Kaddish on a Goy. And uh, actually, some of the opinions are that every person should say Kaddish, even if no one in their family died. Because it's just another way to sanctify Hashem's name. Kaddish, if you actually understand the meaning of the words, I have some cards, some posters in my car if you guys want, explains the meaning of the words. Of Kaddish also teaches you how to say it properly. Um, it's another way to sanctify Hashem's name in a very unique way that only a Jew can do. Why? Because the Malachim, the Malachim are jealous of the Jews because there's one thing that they can do that they can't do. Malachim, all day they serve Hashem, but they don't have free choice really, the same way we do. They have, they have choice, but it's not the same thing like us. Why? Because they get punished right away if they, don't go against, if they go against Hashem. We have time. But there's one thing that we can do they can't do. What it is, we can say Kaddish. They can't say Kaddish. Some say it's because they don't speak Aramaic. And Kaddish is an Aramaic. I think, my personal opinion is because simply they're just not allowed to do it. I don't think that they can't speak Aramaic. I think it's silly. I think they can speak whatever they want because the Gemara is in Aramaic and there's certain uh, stories that you see the angels are in it. But point being is I just think that they're just not allowed to do it. This is just one mitzvah that Hashem gave to Am Yisrael. So a Jew that understands what Kaddish is knows that it's an opportunity to give all of these kinuim, all of these adjectives, descriptions for Hashem to sanctify Him in three different levels of sanctifications and should take the opportunity and do it even if nobody in this family died. But obviously if somebody died, then of course you should do you should say Kaddish um, and never miss an opportunity to say Kaddish. And the reality is that a family that had someone die in their family, you tell them that uh, they uh, shouldn't say Kaddish on somebody that died, it doesn't matter if the son, the father, the whoever it is, um, not only are they not going to listen to you, but most likely 
you're going to destroy the relationship between you and them and most likely between you and Hashem. And them and Hashem. It's not the time. And we have certain mitzvot that are from the rabbis and certain mitzvot from the Torah. 613 from the Torah, 7 from the rabbis. The blessings are from the rabbis. The blessings from the rabbis. Like, for example, you want to eat a fruit, to say a blessing, the rabbi, it's a rabbinical mitzvah. Want to do it at the time? Wash your hands, it's a rabbinical mitzvah. Chanukah, Purim, rabbinical mitzvah. Bring the Megillah, rabbinical mitzvah. And so on and so forth. The biblical mitzvot are like Shabbat, kosher, and so on. Now the Torah says, Ocheach tochiach et amitecha velo tisa alavchet. The Torah says you must rebuke your brother, but don't come to the way of sin. So the Chachamim teach that if, if you see another person is driving on Shabbat, you are obligated to rebuke them, you are obligated to rebuke your brother, but don't come to the way of sin. Meaning, don't get to a point, don't rebuke your brother in a way that's going to become Chilul Hashem. Rebuke him, tell him he's not allowed to drive on Shabbat, but don't start throwing rocks at his window. That's Chilul Hashem. Do it in a certain way where you're actually allowed to do it. But further on, it says that the Loti Salafred don't come to the way of sin. Also, another lesson from here. What's the other lesson? Just like you have the obligation to rebuke your brother when it comes to a biblical mitzvah, you have an obligation to rebuke him. Shabbat, kosher, nida, tarat mishpacha of some kind. Uh, if he's intermarried, you're obligated. You know, there's no other. There's no way out for you. You're obligated to do something. The loti salafchet also means you're also obligated not to say something if you know he's not going to listen to you on your rebuke of a rabbinical mitzvah. If you telling him, "Hey, listen, you have to wash your hands before you eat. You have to wash your hands," and you know this guy is he's not only not going to listen to you. He's going to dafka, not going to listen to you ever again. It's an obligation for you not to tell him. It's a mitzvah for you not to tell him. Because this is a rabbinical mitzvah. Rabbinical mitzvah, don't cause him to sin. Because now he's not doing it because of shogeg. He doesn't know. If you tell him and he doesn't do it, now it becomes mezid. And a rabbinical mitzvah becoming mezid is unnecessary. You're bringing him to sin. You're now sinning. You're causing him to sin. You're putting... A, uh, a uh, something in front of a blind person. But what a lot of people misunderstand is they think that if you know he's not going to listen, then don't tell him anything. That's not true. Only allowed to not tell him anything if it's a rabbinical mitzvah. If it's a biblical mitzvah, there's no way out. You must tell him something. You must tell him. There's no way out of, 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 of not telling him something. To such an extent, the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, I believe it's page 52, says that Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah was judged in Shemaim as a Mechalel Shabbat. Tana, Kadosh, able to revive the dead, was judged in Shemaim as a Mechalel Shabbat once, one time. He said, how do you Mechalel Shabbat? Tana, Kadosh, why you drove on Shabbat? How do you Mechalel Shabbat? He goes, no, his cow carried some bells on Shabbat. So Chachamim said, his cow, Rabbi Lazar's cow? He had one cow? Rabbi Lazar was uh, rich. His maser, how much he gave maser every year? 10%. 120,000 cows. That's his maser. I did the math one time. He was making $1.2 billion a year. He's bigger than a hedge fund manager. Rabbi Lazar made $1.2 billion a year. He said, one cow made him a Mechalel Shabbat. He said, one cow? How one cow? Because no, really, the Gemara says, it wasn't his cow. He didn't have a cow. He had a lot of cows. It wasn't his cow, though, that violated Shabbat. Whose cow is it? His next-door neighbor. Next-door neighbor lived a widow. Miskena, her husband, died. She had a cow, and she didn't know the rules, so she let her cow roam around with the bells on. She's not allowed to, the cow is not allowed to carry on Shabbat. And Rabbi Lazar saw this, and he didn't say anything because he felt bad for the woman. He said, she's a widow already. What am I going to tell her? She's, uh, she's violating Shabbat. Eh, let it go. Apparently, he had such level of sanctity, such level of Kedusha, that he knew that in Shemaim, they judged him as a Mechalel Shabbat. 
Why? He didn't rebuke his neighbor's cow. Not the woman herself, the cow. He didn't rebuke the cow. He's a Mechalel Shabbat. He fasted for the rest of his life. 19 years, he fasted until all of his mouth turned black. Why? Don't judge me as a Mechalel Shabbat. Why? Because of some cow. Meaning, we learned from here, Abutai, there is no chance in the world for you to get away with not telling somebody it's a Mechalel Shabbat or some other biblical sin and say, no, 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 he's not going to listen anyway. No such thing. Only time that you're allowed and even obligated not to say something is if it's a rabbinical mitzvah. If it's a rabbinical mitzvah. So back to your question. In this particular case, if somebody just, somebody's Shem Yechem, their son just died or some close family member died, don't even bother telling them don't say Kaddish on them because they're not going to listen to you anyway. And technically they can say. They can, can say anyway. They can say on anyone. Next question. Ten minutes only, this question is good. What happens in the case of someone you know is not going to listen? Someone you know is not going to listen to, not only that's going to do it on purpose in your face to mock you, but uh-huh. also it's going to make fun of Hashem, even if it is a, a, a rabbi, a, either a rabbinical or biblical mitzvah. I once heard Rabbi Mizrahi say, someone like this. Don't battle with him. Where a person is making fun of Hashem? Yeah, he's going to desecrate the name of Hashem. Uh-huh. If you tell him not to do something, uh-huh. he's going to do it to your face on purpose. Uh-huh. Or he's going to get physical with you. Do you ever get physical with you? Like, what, what makes you think he's going to do all these things? Because that's the kind of person he is. But did you ever see example, it happen? He gave an example of someone who had a. Uh, Um, so, okay, so according to, according to Allah, uh, the Rambam says that the rebuke, you're obligated to rebuke until the person actually beats you up or threatens to beat you up. Now here, from what you're telling me, it's theoretical, potential beat up, potential violence. Um... So really what I would say is a couple of things. Number one, why are you associating with such people? That's, that's the first question I would ask. Why be around such people that are such enemies of Hashem that they are uh, not only not accepting of His rules, but they mock them? Like, Why be associated with such people? For what purpose does it serve in your life? Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, is that if you don't know for sure that this person is going to mock Hashem, you don't know for sure this person is going to go against it. You don't know for sure. It's theoretical. You heard it somewhere. But you don't have, Mamash, a real reason, real ground to walk on, to, uh, to stand on, to say, okay, he's definitely going to do that. I would try it anyway. I would try saying something. And yeah, listen, by the way, that's that. Well, maybe you could do it lighter. Instead of actually saying, um, you know, the specific issue that he just did, because that would make him defensive. So, for example, you just saw him eat non-kosher. And you know that if you tell him, hey, listen, you shouldn't eat non-kosher, you know that he's going to be defensive because he's not expecting it from you, doesn't want to hear it from you, and so on. So instead of doing that, you go in a different approach. How? You give him a CD. Or you send him a lecture, you send him a text message of some kind, without telling him why. Just send it to him. Plant seeds. You plant seeds. Here's a CD. What's this about? Ah, it's a really interesting story. About what? I don't know, some guy from Wall Street. Ah, it's about uh, something about science. Ah, it's uh, something about some guy that died and came back to life. You have to give him the whole, you don't have to ruin the movie for him. And uh, plant the seed that way. Try it that way instead of going direct. It's really the whole thing with, with rebuke is that you have to use the wisdom, the imagination that Hashem gave you to do it the right way. That's also another reason of why Hashem says, Don't come to sin. Don't come to sin means also... Use the imagination that I gave you. I didn't just give you an imagination to draw Mickey Mouse. I didn't just give you an imagination to pick a nice suit. 
I gave you an imagination so you can use it to fulfill my mitzvot. One of the mitzvot is to rebuke. Use your imagination of how to rebuke without the guy even thinking that you're rebuking. So sometimes, and I think more times than not, the best way to rebuke somebody is without rebuking him. Meaning, rebuke him indirectly by giving him a CD, sending him a lecture, inviting him to a lecture. Let him hear it for himself from somebody else, not from you. 99 out of 100 times, it works better. The problem, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. Don't take it personal though. It has to do with me too. The secret has to do with everybody. Do you know why most people's rebuke doesn't work? Most people, they tell somebody, hey, listen, you should keep Shabbat. It doesn't work. Or somebody says, hey, listen, you should eat kosher. It doesn't work. Hey, you should leave the Goya. It doesn't work. You know why it doesn't work? I'll tell you a secret. I actually rediscovered it through a conversation that I had with somebody that told me that he started listening to my shurim, he started doing shurim, and uh, the rebuke worked. And we're talking how, who, what, when, and how. And I understood, I got to see Nishmai during the conversation, I understood why it worked. But not just that one, but every one of them. And why a lot of them don't work. Why they don't work? Because if you're going to rebuke because you want to be right, it's not going to work. If you're going to tell them you'll keep Shabbat because that's what you have to do, because I know you have to keep Shabbat, it's not going to work. If you tell them, no, stop wearing the wig because I know it's Abu Zarah, it's not going to work. You should start doing this because no, 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 I know it's not going to work. You're wasting your time. You're already making a sin. Don't do it. You're ruining everything. You're ruining everything. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the rebuke. It has to do with your ego. You're trying to be right. You're trying to be right. You're not trying to help him or her. When you're telling them, you should do this, this, and this because I saw it. And look, I'll show you the book. And look, the rabbi said it. And look, it doesn't matter. I said it. Ha! Woo! Ha! You have the whole fire in this. And you're right. But you're wrong. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the rebuke. You're just trying to win an argument. For that purpose alone, his neshama will never accept it from you. Why? It's slowly shema. It's not for shemaim. It's ego. It's your ego versus his ego. He says, my ego is better than yours. I'm not going to listen to you. How about that? How about that? Go, go, keep talking, keep talking. Half, how long are you talking? Talk for half hour. No, like your rabbi. Talk like Three hours. Talk, talk, talk. At the end, he says, no, she doesn't. No. Ha! Not going to listen to you. Why? My ego is better than yours. If you're going to rebuke him because of your ego, it's not going to work. That's a secret. If you're going to rebuke him because you care, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you say. If you care, his neshama will accept it. If you care, his neshama will accept it. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter if you make sense. It doesn't matter if you rhyme. It doesn't matter if you say it in a rap. It doesn't matter if you say it through a book. It doesn't matter because he said it. If you care, and he knows or she knows you care, he'll listen. Why? You care so much. I'll do just because you care. Not because of your God. I don't believe it. But I'll do because you believe it. You believe it. I'll do because you believe it. I do because I like you. I don't believe everything you believe. But I like you. So I'll do because of you. And eventually he'll do it. That's why it says, Makom shlo lishma ba lishma. The Chamim asks, what do you mean? What does it mean over here? If you learn Torah, lo lishma, not for Hashem, it says it's better you learn lo lishma, because if you start lo lishma, if you start learning, and fulfilling a Torah, not for Hashem, eventually, you're going to do it for Hashem. Why? If he's doing it because he's trying to get a girl. If he's doing it because he's trying to get uh, some uh, rabbinical award or something. How? What they're trying to tell you, I actually heard of uh, Meir Eliyahu say this, it's brilliant, that no one, no one on earth in the history of mankind, other than our Avot Kedoshim, is capable of starting tshuva purely for Hashem. No one. 
Why? You don't even know him yet. You don't even know him yet. You don't know anything. So what do you do? So why are you doing the mitzvot? You're doing it loli shma. You're doing it because your mom told you. You're doing it because you're trying to get the girl. You're doing it because somebody read the book and recommend the book and you want to make it seem like you actually care about the book so you're going to read the book. You start doing because you want to fit in. You start doing because you want to get to know and who and what. But you're not doing it for Hashem. You don't even know Him yet. So it always starts lo lishma. Why? Because eventually it's going to get to lishma. It always starts not for Hashem. Because you don't even know Him yet. You don't even know what, why and who and when. But if you start that way, honestly, with open heart and accept it, eventually you're going to get to do it for Hashem also. Same thing with rebuke. Same thing with rebuke, rebuke of the time. If the person you're rebuking knows that what you're doing is lishma, he's doing it, you're doing it for Hashem, you're doing it from your heart, not because you're trying to be right, he'll accept it. But if not, it doesn't matter what you say. He's not going to listen, she's not going to listen. Why? Because their ego is fighting your ego and he's going to win. It's easy for him to win. He just doesn't have to listen. The Gemara asks, how come Hashem gave us fingers that look like this? They look like pegs. Our fingers look like pegs. Why did Hashem make it like pegs? Why did Hashem make it like pegs? He says, when you don't want to listen to the Lashon Ara, you put them right in your ears. They fit right perfect. So that's what he's doing. You're talking, dude. La, 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 la. I listen to you. Why? Because I know you're not. You're talking from your ego, not from your heart. That's the secret of our rebuke. That's why it doesn't work for most people. And that's why I tell people, don't rebuke the people around you. Because they know you too well and they're able to determine whether you're doing it from your heart or you're doing it because you're trying to be right. And if you're doing it because you're trying to be right, they're not going to listen to you. And even more so, if it's a debate, they're not even going to allow you to do it from your heart. Why? Because the ego is getting in the way. So that's why it's easier and better and more productive to have somebody else do it. Bring them to a shiur, give them a CD, uh, send them a lecture, meaning you don't have to actually bring the, the rabbi personally or the person personally dare to rebuke. You do it indirectly by showing them the same thing you heard coming from the horse's mouth himself. If I'm the horse, good. I like being a horse. The point is, Abutai, because for me, they don't know me. They don't know me, and I know I'm not talking to them directly. So for them, it's pure. It's pure. Why? They just get the information as it's coming out. There's no ego here. There's no like, oh, he's doing it because he's going to get, uh, what does he get from me? Nothing. Oh, okay. So I'll listen to what he says then. So that's the thing that a person needs to understand. When it comes to rebuke, if you want it to work, you have to remove the ego. And that's one of the most difficult things for a person to do because the Yetzirah is going to try to get you in every single way. That's what we pray every single day for Hashem to bless us and protect us against the Yetzirah from in front of us and behind us, from the mitzvot that are in front of us to do and the mitzvot that we already did so we don't ruin them. A guy thinks he's going to go fulfill a mitzvah. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to fill a mitzvah. What? I'm going to help this guy do tshuva. How are you going to do it? Oh, I'm going to go tell him to keep Shabbat. How are you going to tell him to do Shabbat? I'm going to tell him if he doesn't keep it, Hashem's going to kill him. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, how, how exactly are you going to do all that? Oh, look, watch me. You can see the guy, hey, sir, yeah, he's yelling at the guy and he makes the guy feel like he's like uh, two pennies. The guy leaves it crying and he's not only not keeping Shabbat, he doesn't want to keep the friendship either. Okay, you won the argument, you're right. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right but you're wrong. So there's a way to do it, there's a way to do it. And it's important for a person to know that if it's coming from ego, it's not going to work. You're wasting your time and instead of making a mitzvah, you're actually making a sin. And that's why it says, Veloti Salav Chet. So if you're going to do it, you have to remove all of that ego from you. Don't worry about being right. You don't need to be right. You know you're right. Shem said it, you're right. The point is that you have to make him understand that you're doing it because you care. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that happened recently. I spoke to somebody very special to me. Now, Jews, Baruch Hashem, all special to me because this is why I do what I do. I love Hashem more than I love them, but I love them too. And I spoke to somebody very special. And uh, we're just chit-chatting. And I don't usually chit-chat, but I haven't spoken to him in a long time. 
and I wanted to see what's going on in his world and so on. So uh, after, I don't know, three or four minutes of this, I asked them, so uh, what's going on with Shabbat? You start keeping Shabbat? I heard you kept a couple of Shabbats and uh, are you still keeping it or no? And he's like, no, no, I stopped. I, I did a couple of times and uh, it was good, but uh, I didn't do it anymore after that. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take it. The chit-chatting ended. And I couldn't, I couldn't hold myself. So I told him, listen, you know, you have to find a way to keep Shabbat. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time he tells me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going I'm to try. I'm going to try to keep it. Yeah, I know I got to do it. You know, when I get married, it's going to be a little easier. When I get, everybody has an excuse. And once they get married, and once they get rich, and once they get this, and once they get that, everybody has, Yetzirah gives them endless excuses. It's not even their fault. Wow, Yetzirah has been working on excuses for 6,000 years. They just started 30 years ago. So now he's like, yeah, I know I got to do it. Just, uh, I got to get there, I got to get there. I'm like, listen, no, you really got to do it. But you got to do it right. First of all, you got to understand. If your Shabbat is, is, is boring, you're not going to continue doing it. So what would you do during the Shabbat? You go, no, nah, I just hung out a little bit, relaxed, slept, ate. I'm like, yeah, it's not Shabbat. If you relaxed, slept, and ate, that's not Shabbat. That's a lazy day. It's not Shabbat. If you keep doing that, you're never going to keep Shabbat. You have to make Shabbat a party. Get all your friends to come over. Cook food you've never cooked before. Order food, catering, cook food. Have a bunch of stuff to do, books, lectures. Get stuff to happen, especially if you're young. You know, young guys or people are new to Shabbat. Invite people, get, get something, make it happen. Make it like it's a party every week. There's one guy in, uh, in Los Angeles that I met. He has, he turned this house into literally like a, like a hall. He has 200 people. His name is Yaniv. He has 200 people in his house every Shabbat. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So now, I told him, you have to. You're not going to get 200 people to come to your house. Get five people, two people, three. Get at least somebody to come to your house. Or you go there, go on the uh, app or the website, Shabbat.com, which is an app for you. It's like a social network for Jews. To, uh, to go to different people's houses for Shabbat. It's usually how people actually are, are meeting people for Zivugim. To kosher way to meet people, you go to a place, you see, you do, da, da, da. young guys usually, young girls, young guys, young families, invite people. It's a nice thing to do. Go to a different place on Shabbat, make it interesting, make it fun. Because if it's boring, if all you're doing is sleeping and eating and sleeping and eating, all you are is a cow. That's it. You just replace yourself a human as a cow once a week. But if you make it fun, if you make it fun, especially if you're new at it, it's the greatest thing in the world. This is a must, a must for young people that are single, a must. Married, if you have a good marriage, then you don't need to do all this fiasco. Usually, usually you're enough entertainment for each other. Usually you're enough entertainment for each other. If you have kids, they're enough entertainment for you. You don't need to get to all this balaga and have 500 people in your house. But if you're young, you're single, you have to do this. Why? It's the only way you're going to keep doing it. In today's world, it's... If you're only going to sit there all day, look at the wall, unless you're already in the Torah, I'm talking about brand new, brand new Baal Shuvah, unless you're already in it, you have to do this. You have to get people involved. You have to get your friends involved. Why? So it's not, so it's interesting. I told him, you have to make it interesting. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to do it. So that, that's where the love came from, right? So far, so good? You guys want to keep Shabbat? But then I had to make sure that I had to make sure that he understood what I'm trying to say here. And it just comes out. I don't really control this. It's not prepared. I said, you know, you have to do this. You have to do this. It's fun. It's this. Every week, every week, Shabbat turns out to be the best thing in the world. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. I had to make sure that he understands it's not an idea. I said, no, no, you have to understand. This is not an idea. You have to understand this is not an obligation. You see, I had a guy one time. He told me he's married five years. Five years, no kids. Married, five years, no kids. I told him, five years, no kids, something's wrong. He goes, yeah, the doctor says we can't have kids. I said, okay, which doctor? Hashem said, no, no, the doctor said. I said, okay, so that doesn't mean anything. I find out through conversation, they never had a chupa. Never had a chupa. And it's a conversation I'm telling this person. I said, never had a chupa. I said, Hashem said, Hashem said, we have to have a chupa. 
We have to have Jews have to have a chupa. You want to get married? They can't. You just, can't just go to a local court and say, "Oh, you're married, husband, wife. Go and uh, make babies." No, Hashem said you want babies. You have to have chupa. So he says to me, "Wow, it's really that big of a deal." I said, "If Hashem said it, what do you think?" Hashem said it. He had a lot of things to say. This was one of them. If he said it, it must be a big deal. He says, okay. I said, okay, I'll arrange it for you. We arranged for a chupa. You know what happened, I told him? You know what happened after he had a chupa? Nine months later, he had a baby. Nine months later, he had a baby. Baby girl. Nine months. On the clock. Chupa night, baby. Chupa night, baby. Five years, no baby. He listens to Hashem on something he didn't think he had to listen to. Baby. Now, another situation, same story, same conversation. Another situation, I told him, you guys are married. Somebody was married, new married, brand new marriage. And the husband said, listen, my wife, she wants to go uh, to uh, her mom's house. She wants to go to her mom's house. And I don't want to go. I have work to do and stuff. I said, okay, she's going for the weekend. Just go with her. You guys are newly married. It says in the Torah, during the first year of marriage, you're not allowed to sleep separate from each other. You have to be together. He says, yeah, no, no, but she's not. She's going only for a month. I said, oh, a month's a completely different conversation. Not only you have to go with her, but if you don't go with her, she's not allowed to go at all. You can't. It's crazy. He goes, no. Nah. I said, listen, it says in the Torah. Yeah, it says a lot of things in the Torah. He didn't listen to me. Not me. He didn't listen to the Torah. You know what happened? You know what happened? She went for a month. She went for a month. After a month passed, she didn't get on the plane home. Why not? So the guy on the phone tells me, what, she died? No, no, she didn't die, Baruch Hashem. She's alive. She goes, so what happened? She liked living with her mom. And her mom liked her living with her. She says, you know what? Why don't you just stay here and divorce him? She convinced her daughter to divorce the husband. Why? Hashem wrote it in the Torah. I said, so you know, this Hashem said it. If Hashem said it, it means something. Hashem also said, I told the same guy, I said, Hashem also said, Shabbat, if you don't keep it, if you don't, he said it 12 times. If you don't keep it, he's going to kill you. This is when the conversation changed. I said, Hashem said in, in the Torah, if you don't keep Shabbat, he's going to kill you. So I have to think every day. Every day I have to think, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why. All the loved ones, all the people I love, all of Am Yisrael, all the people, family, no family, friends, no friends. i make a difference. We're all... I have to think, you're all on the line every weekend. Everyone that doesn't keep Shabbat, Hashem's going to kill you. Why? He wrote in the Torah. Not once, not twice, 12 times. I said, so you see, it's a good idea to have your friends over and make a party out of it. But even if you can't get them to come over, you still got to keep it. Why? Because you don't want Hashem to kill you. That's the truth. He says, I understand. I said, I'm sorry I'm scaring you. But it's what it says in the Torah. And I'm only telling you because I'm scared. And your family, they're not telling you the truth. Why? Because they're scared of you. They're scared to tell you the truth because they're scared maybe you're going to get out of this and you're going to get offended, you know, bended, and this, then. And I'm more scared. Why? Because I know Hashem's going to kill you. If you don't listen to him, he's going to kill you. And I'm sorry I'm scaring you. But it's what Hashem said. He says, no. Thank you for telling me. I appreciate you telling me this. I didn't know this. Thank you for telling me. I'm going to keep Shabbat. And he kept Shabbat. The idea is good to show him that you can, you can relate and so on. But you also have to tell him, listen, the truth, it's dangerous if you don't do it. But it comes from the heart. He said, oh, it comes from the heart. It's not him. He's right, I'm wrong. He's wrong, I'm right. I have nothing to do with that. I'm telling him, I'm sorry I have to tell you this news that you're in danger. I'm sorry. But it's what it says. 
I've seen things. I know things. It's not my. It's not my opinion. And the guy that nobody wants to talk to, because they're all scared of him, the big bad monster. What did he say? Thank you for telling me the truth. I'm gonna keep Shabbat. So that's the thing, Rabotai. It's not about you could have said the same words, but if your words or even if my words would have come from ego, what would have happened? He would have hung up the phone. He would have closed the door. He would have kicked me out. He wouldn't have listened. Why? Because it's ego. It's an argument. It's a debate. You're right. I'm wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. It's shtuyot. It's nonsense. It's a waste of time. It's like a presidential debate. It means nothing. But if it's coming from the heart, then you're fulfilling the mitzvah. So that's the thing. When it comes to these people that are difficult, they're only difficult because they have a very, very sensitive BS monitor. They have a very sensitive BS monitor and they know when most of the people that have beards and hats come to them and tell them about something, it's complete BS because all they really want is to get some money. All they really want is some hidden agenda. So if you come to them and say, listen, I don't want anything from you. In fact, I want to give you something. What is it? It's called the truth. It's what it says. Look, here's a CD. Here's a link. Here's a this. Here's a that. You give him something. Give. Give them something. And he'll get what you want anyway. You'll get them to keep Shabbat. But that's the thing. That's how you get these people. It's hard. Some of these people are, have so much tum'ah on them that you have to do this in a very, very creative way, and sometimes it still won't work. But at least you got to try. you got to try. But most of the time when the rebuke doesn't work, it's only because Hashem is telling you you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong, meaning that it's coming from your ego. You're trying to prove people that you know and they don't. I remember when I went to New York one time, Poor kid, young kid, maybe 20 years old, 21 years old, goes to yeshiva for a few years. Did shuvah when he was a teenager. Decided that it's, uh, it's his mission in life to become the family rabbi. And yell at his parents, and yell at his brother, and yell at everybody. And I'm in his house, Baruch Hashem, fancy house, nice house. Parents... Keep Shabbat, but they're not so strict with other things. They need to obviously worry about a few other things, but there's definitely room for improvement. And what the kid is telling them is right. What the kid's telling them is right. But no one's listening to him. I see the whole weekend, there's people over. On Shabbat, I was there, da, 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 everything is good. Eh, Hashem. Kid's trying to give like a shiur, he's trying to tell people, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And I see the whole weekend, I was there for a few days, Oh, we can, I see the parents, everybody's eyes rolled all over. You guys may have seen the eyes roll over to Florida, roll over to California. They rolled everywhere, the eyes. No one's listening to him, the poor kid. No one's listening. He's right. What he's saying is right. He's saying, he's He knows what he's talking about. No questions asked. But no one's listening to him. And what's eating him up is that when I start talking, it was, wow, he's right. He's right. And I'm saying the same thing. I feel bad, but what am I going to do? Not say anything? I'm there already. I only noticed it at the end of the trip. And I also noticed it after I realized he doesn't like me too much. After I left. Uh, but anyway, he sees me talking. And his parents, all of a sudden, they're giving me these compliments. And his brother and the guests. And everybody loves me. Do, 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 do. And him, he's saying the same thing. Same Torah. No one's listening to him. What's the difference? Difference is exactly this. When he's yelling and screaming at them, everybody's saying, No, enough with your big ego, know it all. Do, 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 do. They have a lot of words for him. Me, apparently, they saw that I have nothing to benefit. They're not paying me. I'm not asking for anything. And we're just talking. It happens to be that what I'm talking about is Torah. You want to listen to it? Listen to it. They don't, I don't know what they do, what they don't do, what they keep, what they don't keep. They didn't say that. I just said what it does. You see, there's no hidden agenda. You see, this is purely, it's pure. It's not tainted with anything, with any bias, with any ego. I'm not debating them. This is what it says. And they have the sources and so on. And they're accepting it. And that's the thing you have to understand when you're rebuking people. 
is that it could work. Every single one of you could be 50 million times more productive than me. 50 million times more productive than me. But you have to follow the rules. Rule number one, remove your ego. Remove your ego. Remember, you are doing it to help them. Not to be right. To help them. Rebuke is to help. Not to show your people, show people you're right. Because you're smart and you're good looking and you're this and you No one cares. Help. If you want to help, do it. You don't want to help, be quiet. You're ruining everything anyway. And that's the most important part when it comes to rebuke if you want it to help. And like I said, until you are sure that your ego has been removed completely, it's better to get somebody else to do it. And do it indirectly. Next question. Well, we still have time, guys. How come it's a problem for David Amir to build the Beit HaMikdash because he has blood in his hand? I mean, here in, in Matthew, and in Ryan, it Good talks tea. about, it talks about um, a Kohen not, not being allowed to, to bless the people if he has things in his hand, but the other rabbis says that he can if in two conditions. If it's common in the town, is part is doing part of the job that people like a mechanic, for example, they are known to have things in their hand. In that case, doesn't have a problem. He can do it. Mm -hmm. You know. So if everybody already knows, that, you know, that he has that what what's going on with him, they're not going to be distracted by what's on his hand. So he can do it. Now, in that case, Hashem would have been very familiar with David Amirek if he were to be going by the same way that he has um, blood in his hand. That's not keep him from performing the that means that he wants to do very much. Right. So, when Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hashem, why don't you let me in? The initial response was because you missed an opportunity to sanctify my name. When you hit the Sela, instead of speak to it. It says in a Pasuk, Hashem says to Moshe and Aaron, because you missed an opportunity to sanctify my name, you and you are not going to enter Eretz Yisrael. Is that the real reason? No. Meaning, yes, it is the real reason, but it's not the real reason. Meaning, there's a superficial reason and there's a deeper reason. The superficial reason of why the Vida Melech wasn't allowed to build the Bet Mikdash and only build the foundation was because he had blood on his hands. The real reason is much, much deeper, much more significant. I don't know it. But I do know that that's not the reason by itself. Because simply said, Hashem wanted David Amelech to serve a certain purpose in the world. Once he fulfilled that purpose, he wanted to give his son the opportunity to fulfill the rest of that purpose. So each person has their own role in the world. If David Amelech would have lived one more day, one more day, it would have shortchanged Shlomo one day from Ezmelucha. And Hashem says, There's a rule in my world that one king cannot steal even a day of the next kings, meaning everybody has their time. Just like one person cannot steal even a single dollar of Parnasa from another person. A single dollar, he cannot take it. Even if he opens the door, not only next door, inside your store. This is why anyone that has real emuna should never worry about competition. Of course, you try to do your best to be productive and, 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 and uh, compete in a logical way, but never worry about your competition stealing your panasa, your partner stealing your panasa. That's already decided in Shemaim. Everything is decided in Shemaim. Once they decide in Shemaim that you're going to get a million dollars, no power in the world is going to stop it. The only thing that's going to change is how you're going to get it. Whether you're going to get it from your business or you're going to get it from a lawsuit. Or you're going to get it from an uh, accident, or you're going to get it from a divorce. Or you're going to get it from a lotto. Or whatever, however you're going to get it. But the point, how much you're going to get, Hashem is going to decide already. There was one time, a guy that was in a toilet paper business. And 
uh, this is actually a true story in the 1980s. And uh, you guys heard the story? No? I don't know. You guys made a face remark. I made toilet papers. Like, all of you heard the same story already. No, you didn't hear the story. Okay. No, it's a real story. So the guy, so the guy's in the toilet paper business, he goes to Shul Torah. And the Shul Torah apparently was the last generation of real rabbis that tell the truth. And the rabbi said, according to our Torah, anyone that steals in this world cannot enter Gan Eden, even if they keep all the mitzvot. They keep Shabbat, they lay tefillin, they tarat mishpacha, kosher, they, they give tzedakah, everything. They steal... They cannot enter Gan Eden until they pay it back. Meaning, they're going to go up to Shemaim. They say, hello, I got the deen over here. I'm a tzaddik. Everything is good. Say, oh, let me see. Oh, we're well, sorry, sir. Uh, it says, do not enter. It says your name over here. Do not let him in. Why? Look at your hands, sir. Oh, he looks at his hands. He's blood on his hands. He says, you have blood on your hands. Where's his blood come from? I didn't murder anybody. No, you stole money. If you have blood on your hands, you cannot enter Gan Eden. You cannot enter Gan Eden. So the guy heard the shoe. After the lecture, he comes to the rabbi. He goes, for the rabbi, I got a problem. I got a serious problem. He goes, what? Because I'm in the toilet paper business. In the toilet paper business, we advertise to the market, to wholesalers and so on. We advertise that each one of us is selling, let's say, 100 meters. A roll. Each roll is 100 meters, let's say. But in reality, no one says 100 million meters. So we advertise 100 meters, but no one's going to check it at 100 meters. So I said, you know, 100 meters, I'm going to give them 95. No one's going to notice five meters are missing. So I started that way. Then I said, you know, they didn't notice 95. Let me sell them 90. See what happens. 90, pass with flying colors. I said, you know what? Let me go down. I went to 80. 80 meters. No one said anything, but I said, you know what, let's just do 85, we'll keep it at 85. And that's what I did. He says, Kvod Arav, for the last five years, five years, I'm selling my customers 85 meters as 100 meters. Now, according to you, I'm stealing from them 15 meters with each roll. Now, I have a problem, I want to do tshuva. I, don't, I want to go to Gan Eden. I keep Shabbat. I keep this. I keep this. I want to go to Gan Eden. But you're saying to me, I'm not going to enter because the Torah says it. It's not your opinion. I have a problem. If I call them and I tell them, listen, Rabotai, I've been stealing from you all these years, 15 meters a roll, what are they going to do? They're going to sue me. I'm going to go to jail. And then I can't keep any mitzvah. Now, if I don't do it, then I'm going to gain on. What am I going to do for the Torah? It's a very difficult question. What would you do? You call the guys? You call your customers, tell them I stole from you five years? Have emunah? Or you just gamble and say, ah, hopefully Hashem forgives me. So the rabbi was Tamit Chacham. He says, you're right. Telling them is not going to be productive. Why? They're not going to even give you the opportunity to do tshuva. They're just going to sue you, bankrupt you. Nothing's going to work. Not doing anything about it is too risky. What are you going to do? Give them extra. Instead of giving them the 100 that they're paying for, definitely don't give them the 85. What do you give them? Give them what you've been stealing from them. How much did you take to them? You took 15. So instead of 100, give them 115. Give them 115. And that way, they're going to get paid back little by little without even noticing it. And in Shemaim, your account, you're paying them back. He says, Kvodarav, genius. He said, can you make money? Can you make money that way? Can you stay in business? If you're giving them more than what she goes, yeah, there's enough profit margin in a toilet paper that I could, uh, I could still make money still. It's not as much money. Obviously, I'm losing money here. You know, it's not as much of a profit margin before I was stealing. Now I'm giving them extra. So it's definitely not as much of a profit margin. But it's still enough room that I'm still making a little bit of a living. I could survive. He says, okay, do it. And that's what he does. Every month, he's giving his customers 115 now the Gemara says, Abali ta'er mesi'im be'ado. Abali tameh potchim lo. Someone who comes to become purified, Shemaim, they give him a hand. 
someone who becomes wants to become impurified wants to sin they open a door for him why somebody wants to do tshuva Hashem says come come chapa alecha. I love you come I'll give you a hand to do tshuva you want to do tshuva Baba come 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 my boy. I love you come I've been waiting for you for 3,000 years come he's gonna give you a hand to do tshuva he's gonna give you a hand to do mitzvah you want to do mitzvah I'll come give me a hand you want to do avera don't let the door hit you on the way out that's what it says. Potrimlo. They open the door for him. Meaning, get out. I don't want to see you, Hashem says. You want to do a sin against me after I give you everything? Get out. I don't want to see you. So now this guy saw this, this teaching come to life. How? He starts giving month, two months, three months, six months, eight months. He's doing tshuva by how? Giving his customers more than what they're paying for without them knowing. One day, the news station, investigative journalism... They decide to, what? Investigate the toilet paper industry. One day he sees the news outside of his door. Sir, we want to uh, ask you some questions. Yes? Listen, we've been investigating in time. That's live. It's live on TV. Live on TV. It says, ladies and gentlemen, we've investigated the toilet paper industry for the last few months. And we've looked at all of the local competitions. Each one of the competitors is, is selling and advertising 100 meters per roll. Now, we investigate. Is it really 100 meters? It says, each company on the average is lying by 10 to 20 meters. There, this guy's advertising 100. He sells 90. The other guy, 85. The other guy, 70. The other guy, 65. The other guy, 92. The other guy, 68, 75. No one is selling 100. Except we found one guy who's not only selling 100, he's selling 115. And now we're here, ladies and gentlemen, with this guy. Sir, how do you explain yourself? Why are you giving your customers more than what they're paying for? You know what the guy says? He doesn't say, listen, I'm doing true. I stole from them five years. You know what he says? He goes, yeah, I love my customers. I love my customers. And he says, he says a story. He says the, his business boomed from there, skyrocketed. The ultimate honest guy in the toilet paper business, all the competition went to him. Why? Yeah, these guys are stealing from us. This guy's paying extra. Even if he gives us what he's, 100, it's still better than uh, 62 that we're getting robbed from. Meaning, Hashem Ibarak says, I like your tshuva. I like your tshuva. There was no promise from Shammai. You didn't get any but call that says that I'm going to accept it, but you still did it. You still did it. You didn't get any promise from Shammai it's going to work. But you still, masal nafsho. You still sacrifice your, your life. You sacrificed your money for what? For me. For tshuva, I'll help you out. And that's one of the most valuable lessons that a person needs to understand is that if you want your tshuva to succeed, you must get used to sacrificing. If you don't want to sacrifice, just know your tshuva is probably not going to succeed. There's no tshuva without, without sacrifice. You have to sacrifice. Sometimes sacrificing money, sometimes sacrificing comfort, sometimes sacrificing relationships, and so on and so forth. Sacrifice is a necessity in Judaism. Without sacrifice, there's nothing. Now, sacrifice means it makes you uncomfortable. Not that it makes everybody else uncomfortable. It makes you uncomfortable. Don't make other people uncomfortable. By uh, you know, Sometimes you have a guy... He wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning. He wakes up the whole house. He wakes up the whole house because he wants to go to shul. Hey, hey, you want to go to shul at 4 o'clock in the morning? Chazaku ba'ul. Doesn't mean you have to punish everybody else and steal their sleep. You're not allowed to do such a thing. You want to make yourself uncomfortable by going to nets? Good, chazaku ba'ul. Doesn't mean that you have to obligate everybody else. So, sacrifice is necessary. Of course, you have to, if it's your family and so on, you have to encourage them to come with you. If not that, at least come to the regular minyan. But nonetheless, it's the sacrifice is to make you uncomfortable, not make everybody else uncomfortable. Like, don't go tell your wife, listen, you should, uh, you know, you should uh, really suck it up and just uh, deal with the fact that, uh, you know, you can only eat one chicken a year. You know, just be a vegetarian from now on. What do you mean? You be a vegetarian. You be a vegetarian. No, you should have emunah. You should have emunah that Hashem says, if he wants us to eat chicken, He'll send a chicken to our house. You have a muna. How are you go buy to the buy a chicken from the store? Like people always say, for example, somebody uh, 
has money problems and they come to him for help they come to him for help listen i have some money issues you know the kids they, 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 all the problems with Shemir Hashem, how difficult how difficult it is to live in this world it's so difficult to live in this world now it's not difficult to live in this world because it's a different world from the world before it's difficult to live in this world because no one cares you come to a person tell them listen you know it's difficult uh, I, I don't know i can't pay rent can't pay mortgage the kids are getting kicked out the kids have holes in their shoes instead of the guy getting the message and saying you know what yeah yeah you know what hold on a second and takes out whatever is in his pocket writes a check 500 a thousand two thousand he has the money gives he gets the message he's not waiting for you to say please please you're not a beggar he gets the message he gives you the money what does he say to you yeah you know what it's tough it's tough in the world man you should have a munah though you should have a munah you should have a munah rabbi shimon bar yochai says to such a person worry about your neshama your neshama not his you you worry about your olama if your olama ba for him you worry about his olama zeh rabbi shimon bar yochai says to him don't start telling people have emuna because you don't want to help them. Oh, have emuna, have emuna. No, no, no. You worry about your olamaba. Don't worry about his emuna and olamaba. Him, you want to help him? Help him in olamaze in this world. Help him in this world in olamaze. And that's the problem with some people is that they try to dodge out. They don't want to help. They don't want to help. They don't want to help. And it's despicable. It's despicable. They love their money so much that that's the line. That's when you know who your friends are. When it comes to money, that's when you know when you pretty much don't have any friends. Because as soon as money comes, most people, there's no more relationships anymore. So it's critical to understand that when we're coming to Hashem with our tshuva, it's going to have to require some sacrifice. Sometimes that sacrifice is going to be money problems. Sometimes the sacrifice is going to be discomfort in other places. If you're not in a position where you need to make those types of sacrifices and somebody else comes to you and he's making those sacrifices, asking you for money, or he's telling you he's having problems, no, that's the sacrifice. Hashem is giving you an opportunity to make a sacrifice. How? Take money out of your pocket and give it to him. Don't make him embarrass himself and beg you for money. Volunteer. Why? Because if you don't, Hashem is going to put you in his position. And that's the most important thing a person needs to know is that when they're helping somebody, they're really helping themselves. If you're helping somebody, you're giving somebody a handout, you're helping yourself, really. You're removing that danger from yourself. That's your sacrifice. And it's also your protection so you don't have to go to a more difficult level where you're forced to, to go to the same, same tikkun. Next. It's a, uh, ultimately, the request of all of the lovers of Hashem, not just the Avot um, Kedushim of Ram Yitzhak and Yaakov, but also the uh, regular people, the average people that love Hashem and not just love themselves. Now, since we're talking about you know, money and, and, and honesty and tshuva, 
add a little bit of a uh, chidush, com- a compilation of different things that I learned over the last uh, few days maybe or more, um, that uh, I think you could uh, learn from and take it home and probably this is one of those things that if Hashem, Bezrat Hashem, will uh, allow the words to come out of my mouth like I have them in my head, this is one of those things that can change your life. Um, as we say, when a person wants to do tshuva, sacrifice is necessary. Now, it appears that despite the fact that the Chachamim, it says in the Gemara, pray to Hashem Barach at the time of the Bet HaMikdash to remove the power of Avodah Zarah. To remove the power of Avodah Zarah. Because at that time of the time of the Bet HaMikdash, the first one, Avodah Zarah had an overwhelming amount of power that people would literally chase it in the street. Avodah Zarah, the statues and different types of idolatry, witchcraft and so on, had such power that it actually Hashem allowed those Abu Dazara to heal people and uh, make them rich and so on and so forth. He instilled power into these creations in order to allow free choice to run wild. Now, most people that read that Gemara or heard this story uh, believe that uh, Abu Dazara is gone because the Gemara continues and says that it's gone. But it's not 100% true. It's not 100% understanding of the Pshat of that Gemara. Is that in essence what Hashem did is that He removed the concentration of power that the Abu Dazara had from where it was to other things. In essence, in essence, let's say, for example, you have one atomic bomb. That atomic bomb could be the equivalent of, I don't know, 200,000 uh, TNTs, 200,000 grenades, let's say. But if it's concentrated into one, you have Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and in today's world, much, much worse. But if you take it, and you divide the power up into 200,000 grenades, and you throw one over here, and one over here, and one over here, and one over here, and one over here, yeah, you're causing damage, but it's nowhere near the same level of damage. (coughs) (coughs) So now, in essence, it appears to me that that's actually what happened, is that the power of Abu Dazara was transferred from a concentration of statues and the like into other things, whether it be the Abu Dazara of money or Abu Dazara of materialism in general, be it a wig or a car or otherwise. You could clearly see that people worship their money or their looks, or their car, or their house, or their other form of materialism, literally as if it was God. I have a neighbor that washes his car every Saturday, and he takes care of the tires like you, better than I take care of my baby. Better. We clean, Baruch Hashem, babies are happy, clean, and everything. But this guy cleans the tire, he shines it, you can see a reflection on a black tire. It's unbelievable. I've never seen somebody care about a tire so much. Two seconds later, you're going to go in the mud. You can see he's turned the tire into Abu Dazara. He loves the tire too much, much more than a tire is supposed to be appreciated. Same thing people with money. You ask them, you tell them you have a problem, you tell them you want a loan, you tell them you want a favor or something like that. They treat you like uh, you just tried to steal their wife. 
tell people, hey, listen, yeah, we're, uh, you know, we need, to, uh, we need to raise money, this. Oh, yeah, good luck with that. Well, yeah, but I'm talking to you about it, so maybe you could do something. Oh, no, no, money's tight. What do you mean? You just told me you signed a $10 million deal. You just told me you signed a $50,000 deal. You just told me you sold a house. Uh, commission on a house like this is uh, $25,000. You don't say it to them, but you think it. Why? Because you feel bad for the person. You know Hashem's going to send you the money anyway. But you feel bad for the person that he's an idolater. He doesn't even realize. Sometimes women contact me and they tell me, listen, everything you're saying is right. The wigs, there's something wrong with them. But I can't get rid of it. I can't get rid of the wig. I can't get rid of the wig. Why can't you get rid of the wig? Because everybody else wears a wig. So I'm going to look different. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to this. They're going to this. They're going to... You've turned your, your, your wig into Abu Dazara. You've turned your neighbor's opinion into Abu Dazara. You, you, you're scared of your neighbor's opinion more than you're scared of Hashem's opinion. You're scared of the Shechina more than you're scared of the Shechina. Shechina is neighbor in Hebrew. Shechina is Hashem Barach. You're scared of the Shechina instead of the Shechina. Something's wrong. Now, one of the biggest things that a person needs to understand as far as to make a sacrifice is to work on their integrity, on their honesty. Honesty with themselves, honesty with their colleagues, honesty with Hashem, honesty, just being an honest person. Believe it or not, it's much more difficult than it sounds. People just don't have integrity. And today, it seems like people forget about God until danger comes, until problems come. You see in last week's parasha that Am Yisrael complains to Hashem time and time again. And in chapter 11, in Sefer Bamidba numbers, it says, The people took seeking complaints. They started seeking complaints. So the people took the seeking complaints. They made complaints. And it looked evil in the ears of Hashem. And Hashem heard. And His wrath flared. And the fire of Hashem burned against them. Meaning He burned a bunch of people now where in the Torah you have 613 commandments where in the Torah does it say not allowed to complain where does it say no who knows the mitzvah by heart doesn't say so how can we burn them now you can say if you watch my shiur about the parasha itself from last year, you can say, wait a minute, technically he didn't burn only the, the, the complainers. Who did he burn? He burned against them. He consumed at the edge of the camp. What's the edge? He burned the edge of, of, of the camp. Why? Because that's where all the leaders were. And he burned all the leaders. Why did he burn all the leaders? Because the leaders saw the people complain. The leaders saw the people complain and they didn't rebuke them. He says, you don't rebuke them? I don't need you as leaders. He killed all of them. So you can say that. They didn't fulfill the mitzvah of rebuke and Hashem killed them. But what does it say in the Torah that if you don't rebuke, you die? So even if you use that excuse, use that, it's right, but it's wrong. Even if you use that, it still not doesn't answer the question. The fact that there was complainers, we know. The fact that he punished the people, we know. The fact that he punished the leaders, we know. But regardless of whether he punished the people directly that, that were complained, or the leaders that didn't rebuke them with a death penalty, we still don't have an answer for that. Why? Because it does not say in the Torah that the punishment for complaining is death penalty. Why? Because if it really is, all of us have to do tshuva. When? Right this second. Because we don't stop complaining. Half the reason I do tshuva is to complain to you guys. We don't stop complaining against Hashem. He says, death penalty, Hashem, Hashem. We have to do a new game of Shio now. 
Where do we know this is a... The Kabbalah Masechet Gitim, page 58a, says a horrible story. In my opinion, one of the worst stories I've ever heard in my life. But it's important enough for us to know it because it connects all the dots. The Gemara says that there was once a young rabbi who had a pretty wife and a Talmud that took a liking to his wife. He liked his wife. Thought she was pretty. But the Talmud was a... uh, Jew that kept mitzvot, kept Shabbat, tefillin, you know, everything. So he didn't try anything, but he liked the wife. Anytime he saw her, he said, ah, she should be with me. Now his thoughts are not kosher thoughts, but is it death penalty for that? No. One day the rabbi, the young rabbi, Maybe he works for free like me, so he didn't have any money. So he needs some money. So the guy says, oh, you need some money? I'll help you out. I'll do the mitzvah. The rich uh, student says, oh, you want, you need, you're need you tough with money? I'll help you out. I'll do chesed. I'll lend you some money. Send your wife to my house. I'll give her the money. So the rabbi is Ish Kodesh, Tamim, he's simple. What does he do? He sends his wife to go get the money. He can continue learning. The wife is going to go run the errand, collect the money, come back home, finished. We can pay rent, we can pay this, we can pay this. He sends the wife, the wife go gets the money, but she doesn't come back. For how long? Three days. Three days he's looking for her, she didn't come back. There's no 911 in those days. There's no going on the internet, put uh, wanted uh, pictures everywhere. You're waiting three days, nothing. After three days, he sees the Talmud. He says, Talmud, you see my wife? My wife? No, I saw her three days ago when you sent it to me. But I sent her home right away. But he says, you know, but I heard, I heard that after she left my house, the youngsters in the neighborhood, they took advantage of her. They got to her. If she didn't come back after three days, maybe she likes it, maybe this, who knows? If I was you, I would divorce her. I want to be with her. He says, yeah, you're right. After three days, she's not with you, and then she's with somebody else. Yeah, I have to, but what am I going to do? I have a ketubah, and on the ketubah, I promised her a lot of money, and I don't have the money. So the Rasha Talmud says, what? Oh, you need chesed? I'll help you out. I'll lend you the money. I'll lend you the money. Really? You do me a favor? Yeah, I'll do you a favor. He lends him the money to give her the get, gives her the get, she comes back, gives her the get, get out, to do, do, finished. Some time passes, time to pay back the money that he borrowed from the, from the Talmud. He doesn't have the money, he's still a rabbi working for free. Nothing changed. He doesn't have uh, BezalTashem.org, people donate $12 a day. He doesn't have that. He, uh, he's scanned, he's still looking to build a website. Sonny didn't come over yet, he didn't build a website yet. So now, Rabotai, he doesn't have the money. He sees the Talmud. Talmud says, listen, you owe me the money. He says, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know. Because you know what? You're going to start working for me. Come to my house. You're going to be my uh, waiter, my butler, my chauffeur, my everything. Okay, that's what I have to do to pay you back. Oh, that's what I'll do. What can I do? I don't have any other money. You have to pay back the money. If you don't have the money, you have to pay it in uh, you know, labor. Okay, come to my house on such and such day. He comes to his house. He goes, okay, listen, serve us some coffee in this. And he comes to serve him some coffee and tea. And who does he see? He sees his Talmud and his new wife. Who is his new wife? His ex-wife. As he sees both of them, he starts hysterical crying, but he can't say anything. Why? Because Talmud followed al She didn't cheat on him. The Gemara doesn't say that they were together when she went to his house for three days. He kept halacha. He's just talking. Just talking. He wasn't with her. She wasn't an Eshet Ish. He followed halacha. 
and after he decided he decided to divorce her the guy married her he's right to marry her he's allowed to marry her the guy started crying and his tears went inside the coffee and the Gemara says at that moment that the two tears went inside the two coffee cups Hashem decided to destroy the Beit HaMikdash. Hashem decided to kill everybody. Not just him, everyone. So the question is, Rabotai, what happened here? If you're looking at Alakha, no Alakha was broken. The woman that went to his uh, wife, to his uh, to the Talmud's house, she was going to fulfill her husband's request. The husband, the rabbi, asked her to go. She went. The guy, why she go? Because the guy, the Talmud, volunteered to lend him some money. He's doing chesed. He's doing a mitzvah, no? She went to his house. She didn't come back for three days. But they weren't together, so there wasn't an eshet ish. Wasn't an issue of Eshadish. Wasn't a married woman with a guy. So they didn't make a sin. She didn't come back. It's not good for a marriage, but still not a sin, per se. After that, he saw him and he asked him, Where is she? He says, Listen, I know you should divorce her. Meaning it's still in his choice to divorce her or not. He decided, the rabbi, the Nostola, decided, You're right, I'm going to divorce her. But I have to get money to give her the get, the ketubah. He. Did a mitzvah. What did he do the Tamid? He said, I'll lend you the money. It's another mitzvah. Look how many mitzvah he's getting. He said, I'll give you the money. You, you told her you're going to give her $50,000. Here's $50,000. He made a mitzvah, no? After that, she's divorced. She's available to all. She's a Jew. He's a Jew. He says, you want to get married to me? She said, yes, they get married. After that, he can't pay the money back. He says, listen, you have to pay the money back. I don't have the money. Okay, come work for me. Pay it in labor. He agrees. It's his choice. The fact that he sees his ex-wife, it's a different story. Was any halacha broken here? According to the Torah, that we know of the written, nothing was broken. But the Yavitz, the Hasid Yavitz, says commentary on this Gemara in Masechet Gitin, page 58a. He says, from here we learn something critical. From here we learn something critical, that there are some mitzvot in the Torah that are not written. There are some rules in the Torah, there are some sins in the Torah that are not written anywhere but are so detestable by Hashem, they're so disgusting to Hashem, that He literally is willing to destroy the entire world for them. But it's not written. If it's so big, you want to destroy the entire world, I mean, you should write it at least, no? You should write it. If a Mechalel Shabbat, says Mechalel Shabbat, Mot Yuma, Dicheta Nefesh Me'amea, Shem Yachem, Guy Mechalel Shabbat says he dies in this world, dies in the next world. No Olam Abba, Geno. Shem Yachem, what writes about Mechalel Shabbat? Guy marries a non-Jew. Shem Yachem, what writes about the guy who marries a non-Jew? Loses Olam Abba, his kids are not his kids. It's Shem Yachem. The, the, the Gemara says the Goya is tied to him like a dog for the rest of his world. He's embarrassed forever. Shem Yachem, what writes about him? So if, but this only individual... So if this is such a big sin, why don't you write it in the Torah? So the Or Israel, Rabbi Israel Misalant, connects the dots. He says, the Chachamim teach us something critical about our mitzvot, about our Torah, Kedoshah, is that in several places in the Torah, Hashem says, you must listen to my chukim u mishpatim. You must listen to my chukim u mishpatim. In, uh, where is this? Page 371 in uh, Or Israel. Uh, 
It says in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, it says it's written, Hashem visits the transgressions of a father upon his children. It says this applies when the sons embrace the sinful deeds of their fathers. It seems logical that this is only when the negative quality of the son's deeds are equal to the severity of those of the father and not when the transgressions of the father are greater than the severity of the son. Meaning it explains a certain thing. But now, in Gemara Masechet Yoma, it says there are certain things that are unexplainable. Meaning that we have two types of mitzvot. We have laws, mishpatim, and we have chukim, Now, the difference between the two is when Hashem says, follow my laws, my mishpatim, this is referring to laws that even without the Torah, your logic would tell you that this is the right thing to do. Logical laws. Like, for example, it's logical to know that you shouldn't worship an idol. Logical. It's logical to know you shouldn't murder. It's logical. You don't need to talk for that. It's like the seven Noahide laws per se. But there are many laws that are very, very logical. But when it comes to Chukim, Hashem says in Vaikra 18.4, perform my laws and my statues, my Chukim. What is the Chukim? The Chukim is referring to decrees in the Torah that are actually against logic. They defy logic. Such as shatnez. Why does Hashem care linen and wool? Why does He care so much? Or eating clean animals and unclean animals. Kosher. doesn't really make sense technically. Yeah, you could say, yeah, this, the animal doesn't suffer and this and that, but a bunch of people are going to tell you, no, no, they do suffer. Or a bunch of people are going to tell you that what is an animal care? It's an animal. It's, it doesn't make sense, really. Kosher doesn't make sense. Even though you could say it's healthy, there's benefits, but it doesn't make sense why Shem cares. And there are certain laws that don't make sense, and the Satan, the Malach the Yitzharah, the Amalek, the Kufrim, the Christians, the atheists, that's the laws they make fun of. So look, your Torah doesn't make any sense. So the Holy Israel says, if you make it a sin on a logical law, your punishment is much worse. It's much greater. It's much greater than if you make a sin on something that's not logical. Why? Because logically, logically, any person would understand that you shouldn't do it anyway. So if you're not your nature, you're going against your own nature. It's obvious that it's it's it's, it's there's no mistake here. You did it intentionally. But if let's say, for example, you uh, you did something that's against logic, then you can always say, "Listen, it didn't make sense to him, and yet I get the best of him." So from here we learn, Rabotai, is that the laws that are not written in the Torah that the Yavitz is telling us about and the Gemara is telling us in Gitin that Hashem literally detests them to such an extent that He's willing to destroy the world, those laws are all logical. And that's why the punishment is so great. Those laws are all logical. Now when Am Yisrael complains against Hashem, complains against Hashem about the man, or about the meat, or about the water, or they complain in this week's parashat shlach, they complained about uh, the land. You see that the punishment that they're getting is extraordinary. 
Why? Because it's not logical for you to complain about the gift that Hashem gave you. It's not logical. It's against logic for you to complain. If Hashem gave you money yesterday, then obviously He's going to feed you tomorrow too. What are you complaining about? From here we learn that when a person has no integrity, when a person has no honesty, when a person is just in general, he's just not an honest person, and he cheats, and he lies, and, and, and so on, and he manipulates the Torah to fit his world, the Yavet says, this is a person that could be a tzaddik that goes to Gehenom. Meaning, based on mitzvot, he's fulfilling all of the mitzvot. Tefillin, Shabbat, Tarat Mishpacha, Kosher, and so on and so forth. But he's still going to go to Gehenom forever. Why? Because he broke the laws that are logical, that are not written in the Torah. What's such an example? There's this one rabbi, apparently, I don't know his name, but I just found out the story from Rabbi Ephraim a few days ago. Apparently he has a few dollars. He has no less than three apartments in Israel that he rents out. And in one of the apartments, he split the apartment to two. And one of the tenants is a sickly person. The doctors say there's nothing he doesn't have. Miskin, the guy is sick. He's connected to machines to stay alive and so on. Needs this, needs that. He's scared, the poor guy. Now because the apartment is split into two, the electric side is on the other side. So he doesn't get billed directly from the electric company. He gets billed from the landlord. So apparently last week, he was late to pay the electric bill by one day. One day. The landlord, Imach Shimo, decides to shut off his electric because he's late by one day. Now the rabbi calls this rabbi. Somebody calls this rabbi. He says, listen, what are you doing? You're shutting off the electric. Do you know what you're doing? He's connected to a bunch of machines. He's connected to a bunch of machines. It could mean life or death. You know what he says? Listen, he didn't pay me on time. I don't have time for this. I'm on the way to go give a shield to Allah. If you like him so much, take him to your house. He's going to give a shield Torah. I don't have time for this. He's going to go give a shield Torah. I don't have time for this. If you like him so much, take him to your house. Now, according to him, he's a rabbi. According to him, he's following Allah. He didn't pay for the service. I don't have to continue giving it to him. Now, if the son of Andrin were here, do you think they would even have a trial for him or they would just put him into, uh, into, into the fire right away? You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a, a, a big Talmud Chacham. All you have to be is human to understand this is wrong. But unfortunately, when we are, have turned money and kavod into our Avodah Zarah, we can't see past our own ego, our own bank account, our own reflection, we can't see anything. And therefore, the fact that you just turned off the electric for a guy that needs it to survive, and you're going to kill him potentially, because unless he had a, he has a generator, so he's, he's, he's still alive, he's still kicking. Like you just took his life in your own hands. For what? For a couple hundred dollars. Do you understand? This is a naval birshut Torah. This is a person that's despicable in the name of the Torah, but there's no sin directly. It's written in the Torah, but what's happening? But this is logical. This is logical. So this Rabotai is the same thing you're going to read about Am Yisrael. You're going to ask yourself sometimes the question of why is the sin so harsh? Why is the punishment so harsh? Okay, they complain about food. I mean, they're hungry. Okay, they complain about water. They're thirsty. Okay, they complain about, I don't know, all types of shtuyot they complained about. But it must have been real for them. It must have been painful for them. So why is the punishment so harsh? Because it's an unspoken sin in the Torah. Don't complain to Hashem. Pray to Him. Don't complain to Him. 
Pray. Don't complain. Why? You're alive. That's already chesed from Hashem. You have ears, you have eyes, you have a nose, you have a lip, you have a, you have a wife, you have a husband, you have children, you have air in your lungs. That's already chesed from Hashem. He doesn't owe you any of that. Now, I know it's hard to get our heads around it. It's like, yeah, I got all that stuff, but, you know, I need other stuff. Okay, just like he gave you this stuff that you don't even appreciate, that none of us really appreciate, he'll give you the other stuff. When? When it's time. When it's time, I'll give it to you. The point is, don't get used to complaining to Hashem. Pray to Him, yes. Complain, no. Why? It's an unspoken sin. It's an unspoken sin. Hashem doesn't like complainers. He likes people that pray to Him, but not complain. Complain? What are you complaining? Complaining is, in essence, you're telling Hashem that He made a mistake. That's kfirah. So here, Rabotai, it's important. It's really, really important for all of us to learn how to not complain. Pray. Learn. Sacrifice. Analyze the situation. Try to figure out why is this happening. Try to look for the benefit. Because just like Rabbi Akiva says at the end of Masechet Brachot, everything that the merciful one does is always for the best. It's always the best. How could it be always the best if somebody died? How can it be always the best if somebody just lost all their money? How can it be always the best that somebody just got sick? How can it be the best that somebody just lost a job? How can it be the best that somebody got a flat tire, couldn't make it to this you? How can it be the best? Because all of the other options available in the infinite world of Hashem were much worse. Were much worse. There was a certain deen a certain decree that that person deserved. A certain deen. He did something 20 years ago he forgot about. Hashem didn't forget. He embarrassed somebody in public 20 years ago. He called him a name in public. He stole some money. He kicked somebody in the face. He didn't say, I'm sorry. He did something. Whatever he did, he forgot about it. Why? Now he's tzaddik. Now he's had. He is. Ooh, I just give him shulim now. No, she she tell people to take off the wig. Tzadikah, Rabbani. All of a sudden you see she lost all her money. All of a sudden you see that uh, she broke her arm. All of a sudden you see she got into a flat tie. What happened? Oh, you remember 20 years ago uh, you did this, you did this? Ah, oh, why, he couldn't forgive it? Yeah, he did forgive it. That's why you got this and not the worst part. In reality, someone that embarrasses another person in public, the Torah says, En lo chelik lo has no share of the world to come. Hashem, instead of taking your ulama ba, instead of taking the person's ulama ba, which doesn't mean nothing. People think, oh, he has no ulama ba, that means he just goes black. Like, he dies and everything turns black. No. No ulama ba means eternal suffering. I.e. eternal suffering. Not black. Red fire, blue fire, green fire, all types of fires. It's definitely not black. So when somebody embarrassed another person in public, Hashem said, oh, no, no share of the world to come. They did tshuva, started keeping Shabbat, started being nice, working on their midot and so on. He said, ah, you did tshuva, okay, I want to give you a lamba. I want to give you a lamba, but you still have to pay the bill. You still have to pay the bill, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take all your money. I'm going to take all your money. Why? Because you did this. Now, if you really understood that everything that Hashem does is for the good, what are you going to say? Thank you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. It's much better than the fire. It's much better than losing the Lama losing a little bit of money, losing a little bit of this, losing a little bit of honor, respect, and so on, all the shtiot. So that's, Rabotai, all of those things that are happening to us in our life, I know it's hard, trust me, I deal with hardship every single day, mind, directly, indirectly, and so on, I understand. But this is part of your tshuva. This is life. Life is hard. But suffering is your choice. Life is hard. There's no question about it. There's ups, there's downs, there's this, there's that. There's, th there's difficult things that happen in life. But suffering is your choice. Why is it your choice? If you're not looking for the real good of why Hashem is doing it for you, then you'll suffer. Why? Because you're always going to think, oh, he's punishing me, I'm the worst, 
he's the worst, we're the worst. All you're going to do is going to complain. You're going to complain, 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 and just like bathe in your own misery. And you're going to be miserable your whole life. And no one's going to want to be next to you because they're miserable just by being next to you. And you're never going to progress. You're never going to get out of your own shadow. You're never going to get out of your own, your, own, your own mess because you're always thinking about, oh, I'm punished, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. You're always a victim. Instead of thinking, wait a minute, there has to be a good reason out of this that Hashem is doing this for. He doesn't punish such a big punishment for no reason. There has to be a reason. Why? If he wanted to just punish me the worst, he doesn't even have to keep me in this world. Just take me out, put me in a much more uh, uh, designated area for punishment. So the point is, Abutai, is that Hashem is teaching us all of these things in the Torah. You see in the parasha, there are, there's the story, and then there's behind the story, and behind the story, and behind the story, and there's details, and details, and details, and details. We see here, Abutai, is that there is a hidden law. There's the oral law, there's the written law, and out in between those two, there's the law that is logic. Hashem gave you a brain to figure out this logic. That logic, if you use it, if you use your logic correctly, you be tzaddik. You be tzaddik. Tzaddikah. Why? Because your logic, used correctly, will never go against Hashem. Because it's illogical to go against Hashem. Your logic will always make you generous. Your logic will always make you kind. Your logic will always make you humble. Your logic will always make you do a mitzvah. Why? It's logical to do a mitzvah. It's logical to serve Hashem. It's logical not to complain. It's logical not to be angry. So that's where the Yavitz is telling us that there are certain things in the Torah that are unwritten, but Hashem hates them. Hashem hates them. A person that's dishonest, a person that takes the Torah and perverts it, it makes it look like he's following the Torah, but at the same time, he's following his desires. That person has a special place in Gehenom, and the Yavid says, that person, he's a tzaddik that goes to Gehenom and doesn't leave. And it also said the, uh, that this is also why they call the, uh, the Sefer Bereshit, Sefer Bereshit, the book of Genesis, Sefer HaYashal. Why Sefer HaYashal? Yashal means straight but also means like integrity it says all of the rules about in integrity you learn from avot you learn from avraham Yitzhak, and yaakov you could read sefer bereshit a million times and still not get everything yet you want to learn integrity learn how avraham Yitzhak, and yaakov behaved any questions Hopefully this, another step closer to tshuva, another step to understanding more and more of what our purpose is, another step of understanding how to even, not only fulfill the will of Hashem, but fulfill it with a smile. And not complain as much. Not f make ourselves into victims as much. Because when, you're, when you feel you're a victim, you're right, you're a victim. But you're a victim of yourself. You're a victim of yourself. So Bezat Hashem, this would also be for Refuash Lema, for uh, Rabbi uh, David uh, Boton Ben uh, Yonah. Hashem will give him Refuash Lema, Refuash Nefesh, Refuash Aguf. And uh, all of Am Yisrael, Bezat Hashem, will have Refuash Lema, Refuash Nefesh, Refuash Aguf. I think there's a lot of different things to learn from how to rebuke, why to rebuke, why to, compl to complain, why not to complain? All the different things, these different tools, are th tools you can take home. If you watch the shiur again tomorrow, pick one. Pick one thing and do it. Do it for a week. See what happens. A week, not the whole life. Just a week. Don't commit for your whole life yet. Not your life. One week. Take one thing from the shiur. Commit for a week. See what happens in your life. See what happens in your life. That's the point of all these shulim. I know you're not going to do all of it. I'm not going to do all of it. No one's going to do all of it right away. It's going to take time. Do one thing. Take one. Take one, do it for a week. See what happens. See what happens after a week. You do it for a week, it works, keep doing it. Oh, but it's hard, but it's worth it.
It's like saying, oh, it's heavy. Yeah, but it's a diamond. Okay, I'll keep carrying it. You understand? So that's, that's the key. The key is to take the shurim and not just come here to be entertained. Like some people, in the, uh, you know, they come to shurim and they come to be entertained. Don't come for entertainment. It's not a movie. Some people are online. They watch the shurim. I see they're watching the shurim for two, three years already. Nothing's changed. They're still going. They still haven't changed anything. Still haven't changed any midot. Still angry. Still cheap. Still uh, arrogant. Still this. Still that. But it's like, oh, listen, is the shiur going to be on time today? Because it's always late. And say, it doesn't matter for you. It's entertainment anyway. What difference if it's live or not live? It's entertainment. Oh, no, I set up my schedule to make sure it's on time. It's on time. It just doesn't make a difference if it's on time. If you don't listen to it, what difference does it make if it's on time or not? The point is, Rabotai, is to use these shurim, take them, write them, put them in your head, and apply them. Apply them to your life, because that's how Chuba works. But Zod Hashem will have, uh, she'll continue on uh, Tuesday night in the uh, Breslov Center. We have our Pirkei Avot series continue. We, I believe we are uh, in part two of the same Mishnah, about a good Talmid. So we'll talk about what's a good Talmid. Also, I promised you guys uh, how it connects to Ruch HaKodesh, how to get Ruch HaKodesh. There's actual real instructions of how to get it. Both in the Gemara and also in the Sifrei Chachamim. Whoever wants to get Ruch HaKodesh, make sure not to miss the Shiur on uh, Tuesday and make sure you bring a notebook. Make sure you bring a notebook. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.